We move on to do a full reaction to France. Um, they got the win over Belgium in, uh, in the Nations League. Um, and then we'll discuss some of the rest of the Nations League fixtures. But we do have to start off with France taking on Belgium. Kulumwani, he gets a brace as he leads France past with the goal in the 35th minute and then he, uh, a penalty that he took advantage of in the 35th minute and then slotting in that second into the 62nd um, to make a 2-1. Luis Openda, he got the equalizer, original equalizer for Belgium on the stoppage time of the first half, but eventually Kulumwani scores again. Too many got uh, uh, sent off um, later on in the 76th minute, and uh, but France were able to hang on there get that 2-1 win at the um, King Badun, uh, Badun Stadium in, um, in Brussels. Um, and look, you know, underwhelming game for France, I do have to say. We say that a lot. You know, speaking of the French national team this year, you look at the statistics, 20 shots Belgium, 14 shots for France, 7 shots for Belgium, 4 shots for France, 46% possession for Belgium. Um, this is not the necessarily, not necessarily the most dominant of games um, for France. These are both teams playing a little bit shorthanded, both teams missing their talisman. And Mbappe, you know, the whole thing going on, um, you know, he's not involved in the squad right now. De Bruyne, he, um, he asked for a break for this recent um, fixtures, fixture as well. So he, um, he wasn't involved in this international window. And um, yeah, in a Randall Colomani that got the brace. By the way, Colomani, you know, he's almost two different players that you see for France and Belgium. It just seems like he plays, he has a comfort zone playing for France. It's something that he's, um, maybe he thrives in the style of play that France, you know, um, that France adopt. But, you know, at PSG, he's just a shell of the player that we see of him at France. And, you know, he's had some big games for France, you know, so um, the last couple of years has some big, big performance since he scored the winning goal in, in the game against the um, Belgium in the, he, he scored a winning goal against the Belgium in, uh, against Belgium in the European Championship. He also, I believe, scored a goal in the semifinal um, against, um, against Spain. Um, not against Spain. Yeah, against Spain. Um, he scored the goal on the back post. Uh, so, so yeah, I just, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, he's, he's actually the only player that scored for France in the, you know, knockout stages at this European Championship. So, yeah, he's, a, he's just a different player playing for them, for France. And, yeah, France didn't play the best game, you know. You know, Belgium had their opportunities. Belgium had a majority of the chances created. I think France, you know. In certain moments, they looked sloppy, unorganized, didn't really look like, you know, they had a set way of how they wanted to attack Belgium. Everything looked a little flustered, looked very unlike France. No organization, no discipline to um, Chouameni. He got sent off later on in the game. Um, and they looked a little bit open at certain periods, France did. But... um Look, I just think the reality is to come that this French national team is not the French national team of the past. That dominant team that we saw from about the 2018 World Cup to the 2022 World Cup. And maybe you could include the 2016 European Championship because that's a team that reached the final. And they should have won that European Championship, quite frankly. You know, they lost to a Portugal team that, yeah, they shouldn't have lost to. You look from that 2016 to 2022, you know. This French team, what we've seen from them this year, is not at that level. They cannot control the games without the ball that those teams could control the game. They cannot create the opportunities that that team had. They, this team doesn't have the warriors that that team had. I'm talking about the Giroud's, the Griezmann's, the N'Golo Kante's. Well, N'Golo Kante, he's not involved in this, but he's I think he's still involved with this current makeup. But they don't have the play, the Matuitis, you know, the players that do all the dirty work. Rabiot, he was one of those players to an extent, but he, you know, he doesn't have a club right now and he needs to get himself sorted before he can be introduced. You know, you're looking at this team, it's not it's a shell of that team, you know. You have a Dembele team that has no Dembele that has no end product. You have a Barcola who's a young player with experience but a little bit, you know, a little bit toothless sometimes in his cutting edge and his final 
با Colomani who yes he shows up for the national team but at the club level nowhere to be seen you got players like Kone and Gunduzi you know these are decent players but this is not a Pogba Matuiti Kante midfield these are not those sort of players I think the back line though is you know the back five I think is absolutely great you look from Kunde to Konate to Saliba to this game was Lucas Disney but other games will be Theo Hernandez and then Mike Manion that's is bravo i'm talking about midfield up major major concerns for france entering you know the world cup qualifiers which should start i believe in march for them um and you know you know they're still in it they're still alive in this nation's league they only find themselves a point behind italy um and they get the chance to take on italy away at um uh, away i believe the game would be played at the yeah at the start no at the san siro it'll be played at the san siro you know, so for instance, does have everything to play for, and Italy still have to play Belgium as well in Belgium, which, you know, that could be a potential, you know, place that Italy might drop points. So, who knows? Who knows what we'll see? Um, yeah, that will, you know, uh, you know, who knows? But um, Italy right now, they are look in the comfortable zone to get out of the, um, to get out of that group. They got a 4-1 win over Israel. Um today um playing that game at the uh blue energy stadium um in uh actually uh in in, in udinese um in uh, the province uh in uh at the where udinese plays um so yeah they were able um to get that a win you know, Rategi, he's getting, he got on the score sheet again. He's enjoyed a really good season so far in Serie A. Giovanni Dolorenzo scored two goals. Fratesi get on the score sheet as well. Um, yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, honestly, the most important thing there for if you're, you know, if you're um, France is just take advantage of, you know, not France, if you're um, Italy, just getting that victory, you know, you have to get three points in these sort of games when you have Belgium and France and you, you know, left to play as they want to, you know, approach the quarterfinal stage. If they wanted to reach the quarterfinal, this was a must win and they did that in supreme fashion. I think they've played some really, really good football since, in my opinion, a disappointing European Championship. And now with 10 points, I think they find themselves a good position, only one point away above France, but they have a chance to take on France and they get Belgium team at home. You know, will Italy get out of the quarterfinals? You know, will they protect that lead with France and Belgium? It's a little bit difficult, but I'm, you know, I, I believe in Italy. What they've been able to do so far, they have had a really, really, really good um, Nations League. Just looking at what we saw from the European Championship. Um, before we get to the Germany Netherlands game, Wales got a 1 0 win over Montenegro, Ukraine Czechia 1 1, Sweden got a 3 0 win over Estonia, Turkey beat Iceland 4 2, and then Hungary, uh, Hungary defeated Bosnia Herzegovina 2 0, um, Albania got a 1 0 win over Georgia, Slovakia beat Azerbaijan 3 to 1. Um, and the, yeah, Germany Netherlands. Um, Germany. Were able to win 1-0 they played this game at the Allianz Arena some of the players that retired over the past international over the past few weeks now Manuel Neuer, Ilkay Gundogan, uh, Manuel Neuer, Ilkay Gundogan, Thomas Muller, um, Antonio Kroos who was actually not there they were all recognized um, for their achievements and it sort of was the passing guard now with Germany this is a new team now being captained by Joshua Kimmich a younger team led by the likes of Kimmich, Gnabry, Wirtz, um, Musiala um, who was not uh, who was not involved today but Musiala um, you know this is a little bit of a new look team and they went out with you know some new, not new players, some players, you know, some inexperienced players for the German level. Talking about Stiller playing in midfield, Lewelling, Kleinsten. Um, and there was a good opportunity for them to show Julian Nagelsmann what they can do. And this is a Nagelsmann that's turned around Germany. I thought overall in this game, you know, they did some good things here and there. Netherlands lacked that cutting edge. Were really toothless, I do have to say. Really toothless going forward. Didn't create anything. Only had three shots in the game. Only managed one shot on target. It was, it was disappointing. Very, very, very 
disappointing Netherlands were. But Germany overall looked really, really good. They have a young core to build with going forward, I do have to say. And it's very exciting if you are a German fan. This is a team that's not had the, you know, not had the most success, you know, pre this European Championship going back to the, you know, the 2018 World Cup. But now they're starting to build some forward momentum and they look like a national team with promise and a national team that has high, high potential entering the World Cup. Because look, I've said this many, many times, but the German national team at this European Championship was the best team at the European Championship despite, besides Spain. The only reason why they didn't finish ahead of what they, you know, they didn't finish as far as what they should have is because they went up against the best team in the quarterfinal sometimes that happened you can be the second best team in the tournament and take on you know the best team in the tournament in the quarterfinals because the quarterfinals is primarily all the first place teams in the group taking on against each other barring a few upsets here and there in the round of 16 and what happened was germany and spain just happened to be on that side of the bracket on that you know in that quadrant and they faced off in the quarterfinal, and it was really the final of the final. If you look, if you saw how the game went, you saw the intensity, the quality, how it came down to the last minute extra time winner. It, you know, it sort of proves my theory, and it makes me even double down on my opinion that Germany is a dangerous, dangerous outfit going into the 2026 World Cup.